Hello there, my name is Christopher Pryor and I'm a lecturer in Imperial History at the University of Leeds and I'm here today to talk about decolonisation, the end of the British Empire after the Second World War. Our focus for today's talk will be the question, how important was Indian independence in 1947 in changing British attitudes to decolonisation during the period from 1945 to 1960? It's going to be a very simple structure today. What I'm going to start with is arguing from the viewpoint that yes, the events of 1947 were important in changing British attitudes. Then I'm going to look from the other point of view, that 1947 wasn't a turning point, and I'm going to do this in two ways. Firstly, I'll suggest that there were other events that were more important in changing British attitudes during this 15-year period. And secondly, I'll question the extent to which the British actually wholly changed their attitudes. So three things. Firstly, arguing, yes, the events of 1947 were important, then challenging this in two separate ways. The British politicians of the post-war period like to emphasise in public that the attainment by colonies of independence away from the British Empire was part of a grand British scheme. Most of the newspapers of the period, such as the Times, put forward this idea in their editorials. They argued that what was happening with India and other places was exactly the same as what happened in New Zealand, Canada and other places such as that from the middle of the 19th century onwards. While some genuinely thought that this had been the aim of the British all along, this claim about a grand British project was mainly stressed by politicians and journalists as a means of avoiding embarrassment, a, a way of avoiding Britain losing face. By emphasising Britain's supposed benevolence, it was thought it would be possible to make the end of empire seem a source of altruistic strength rather than national weakness. However, the extent to which this propaganda worked and convinced the British public is limited. If you look at a lot of the imperial culture of the time, for instance a film like Black Narcissus of 1947, you get a sense that the British were registering a sense of imperial crisis, that the British could no longer go about doing what they wanted in India anymore. This type of depiction of India is very different to that which went on to the silver screen in the 1930s. Films like The Drum or Gunga Din, they'd been far more uncritical in their belief that the British were always able to win out over their enemies and difficulties out in the empire. With these works of the 30s, the British were always victorious. They were always manned. The empire was always manned by decent, stiff upper-lipped types who always knew what was best. So any difficulties they came across were temporary. But in these new works of the 40s, there was instead sometimes defeat. I'm sorry to give you the ending of the film away in case you do end up watching it. Uh, but in the, in, uh, for instance, at the end of Black Narcissus, uh, the idealism of a group of nuns is defeated. The India or the Indian landscape or the Indian people end up defeating them. And of course, India was known as the jewel in the crown, the glitz and the glamour of the empire. The land that fired up the imaginations of Kipling and the countless children and adults who read his work. So the independence of India was a shock to the British public because it represented the end of a particular view of empire. The view that the empire was something gloriously romantic and timeless. The extent to which the loss of India was felt by the British can be measured by the amount that was written about this compared to the end of empire elsewhere. Works like Staying On by Paul Scott produced in the 1970s were still, despite the fact that this is 30 years after independence, they were still filled with a sense of sadness and nostalgia for the disappearance of a past world. There was no real equivalent to this sort of thing when it came to Nigeria or to, Sud or to the Sudan, for example. However, we need to detach shifting ideas of the public from shifting ideas of the government. The granting of independence to India in 1947 doesn't mean that it was in 1947 that the British government suddenly became reconciled to the idea that it was necessary for India to become independent. The act of granting independence did not in itself change many official British attitudes towards empire 
and imperial strength. Indeed, the end of British rule in India had been envisaged by many since before the end of the Second World War. During the conflict, there had been plenty of discussion in the coalition cabinet over the future of the country. By 1945, the Labour members of that coalition were all pretty much reconciled to the idea that Indian, India would have to be given its independence. So when Clement Attlee came to power following the landslide election victory in 1945, there was no real major readjustment of attitude required on the part of London. So it had been clear for a while to officials that Britain could no longer realistically hold on to India. British government officials were aware of the extent of the Quit India movement of 1942, even if they did their best to hide these troubles from the public or to dampen them down. As inter-community violence escalated, as Muslims and Hindus increasingly clashed over their visions for post-independence India, Britain could no longer keep control. This only grew it over time. Riots and demonstrations were commonplace in the months prior to decolonisation. These grew to such a degree that the Viceroy, Lord Wavell, noted on the very last day of December 1946 that, while the British are still legally and morally responsible for what happens in India, we have lost nearly all power to control events. We are simply running on the momentum of our previous prestige. Furthermore, by 1946 to 1947, India was not really deemed essential to Britain's continued global status. Really, since the 1920s, India had ceased to be a central supporting pillar of the British economy. In 1914, British goods had accounted for two-thirds of all of India's imports. By the 1940s, this had fallen to just 8%. So by the end of the Second World War and the early months after it, there was already a sense that India would have to be granted independence. The speed with which this occurred is something that was inconceivable to most before 1939. So in this instance, it's the Second World War that represents the real turning point. The extent to which 1947 was a turning point can be minimised further if we look at other significant events between 45 and 60. Of these, the most significant is the Suez Crisis of 1956. And a lot of work's been done on this. The historian Roger Lewis has argued that this was what really knocked the political stuffing out of the British government. Nasser's nationalisation of the Suez Canal in July 1956 sparked British indignation both inside and outside of the British government. In the wake of the British, French and Israeli invasion of the Canal Zone, the US threatened to sell off its reserves of the pound, which would have sparked a collapse of the currency. On the other side of the political divide, some in Britain feared that the Soviet Union would threaten to fight on the side of Egypt. At the same time, members of the Commonwealth, such as Canada and Australia, were hostile to British actions. All of this led to a withdrawal of British troops from the region. Anthony Eden resigned as a result of the ensuing fiasco and faced international condemnation. The shock to the system when they realised that they couldn't act independently of the United States in particular was significant. All in all, on the face of it, you have a lot of reasons why Britain would move towards dismantling the empire. You have Britain's economic weakness after the Second World War and the ensuing use by Britain of American financial aid. You have rising anti-colonial sentiment, which led to the fighting of wars in certain places like Cyprus, like Kenya and like Malaya. However, what I find really interesting is the fact that in spite of all of this, the British government doesn't rapidly abandon the idea of running an empire. Instead, there was an emphasis upon streamlining empire. There was an emphasis upon getting rid of bits Britain didn't want to concentrate on other bits. For instance, the British passed over the matter of Palestine to the United Nations. At the same time, there was a change of emphasis. The government started to turn more towards Africa as a site for development and a sustenance of the imperial project. 